Good morning. I'm Bob Rose. I'm the founding chair of the Academy of Research Mentors. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here today um, for our Mentoring Matters uh, workshop. The, um, I'm also welcoming you in the name of several of the other organizations that have worked collaboratively with us at the ARM to get the Mentoring Matters workshop up and running. The Academy of Master Teachers, the Faculty Senate, um, the uh, Office of the, of the Provost, and the Institute for uh, Translational Sciences, my home. Um, our program is really in two parts. The first part are our presentations from our, our esteemed guests, and then the second part of the uh, day is organized in terms of group discussions. Each table uh, will have a uh, discussion leader, and we are the, the groups are asked to review two topics, uh, each for an hour, and after the hour discussion, we will be providing you a um, laptop and so that the scribe in each table, and each table should have a scribe volunteered uh, or volunteering, uh, take notes as to what the most important uh, topics that your group came up with and recommendations for our future focus. I'll review this again uh, this morning um, before we start our roundtable discussions and we can then also move around some depending upon the distribution and availability of discussion leaders and also to try to achieve some diversity uh, in uh, the membership of each of the discussion groups. Uh, it's um, my pleasure to welcome Dr. Jacobs, uh, our Dean and Provost, who will be providing us some initial orienting comments and, and adding his welcome to you today. Danny? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Rose, for that uh, introduction. Um, I am uh, honored to, to provide some uh, overview and also to extend the welcome. Um, you know, it was important to me uh, to look at this conference as a culmination of the hard work that's been going on on the campus for several years. As Dr. Rose uh, referenced, you know, this effort perhaps began in 2012, where he was the founding chair for the Academy <laughs> of Research Mentors, and this was the partnership between him and Dr. Grazier, who's director of ITS. So I think it's fair to say at UTMB we're now just beginning to see the fruits of their labors from what began perhaps as a task force a couple years ago to now uh, what is a burgeoning, more coordinated effort regarding mentoring across our campus. Uh, this uh, snippet from the website is important to me. It talks about the charge for uh, the Academy of Research Mentors where we facilitate an enhanced mentorship of young and developing junior faculty members, uh, mentors, uh, junior faculty uh, members, I should say, and trainees at UTMB. We're working to develop faculty mentoring and team research skills, and ARM, importantly, is matching uh, junior, uh, juniors needing a mentorship with senior faculty mentors. Oops, sorry. So uh, this is a paper that I that I referenced. It comes from the C Canadian Family uh, Physician Journal in 2010. It talks about an apprenticeship model among different models uh, for mentoring. Here in the apprenticeship model, the trainee is mentored by a more experienced professional. It's less personal than some of the other models. There's the cloning model, which is based on role modeling. Uh, here, the mentor, for example, might plan succession with the mentee who is an heir apparent. There's a nurturing model where a safe, open environment is created. Here, hopefully, mentees can discuss and develop uh, with their mentors, uh, where the mentors act as resources and facilitators. And then importantly, which is, I think is sometimes forgotten, there's the friendship model. And here, the mentors and the mentees are typically at the same or close to the same professional level. All of those things uh, lead to productive uh, uh, interactions, which is sort of the foundation for the mentoring and mentee model. This survey was uh, uh, in, uh, interesting to me. This was a survey I think that Dr. Rose coordinated where they uh, solicited opinions from UTMB faculty members. There were about 300 uh, responses. And interestingly and importantly, about uh, two-thirds believed they would benefit from mentoring. But the third bullet point was also impactful. And here, 75% thought that mentoring had either had an important impact on their lives or they had seen the impact, the positive impact of mentoring on others. And that got me to thinking about my own path a bit in terms of uh, mentors and role models. 
<laughs> so uh, to me, it started uh, what I call here the lessons from the old folk. And here are some quotes that uh, uh, were said to me as I was coming along. Chance favors you if you're ready. Uh, when you look into a mirror, be honest about who, who's looking back, the ability to be, to, the ability to be introspective. And then one of my favorite uh, expressions from Aunt Siso, who was uh, a bit of a hard ass, she said, play it straight, no chaser. Uh, that meant, you know, be deliberate, be focused. Uh, if you're doing a good job, congratulate yourself. If you can do better, hold yourself accountable. Well, uh, there were some other folks uh, that were important to me. There in the middle there is a big mother, we called her. That's my mother's mother, Marie Moore. And her favorite expression was, if cream rises, means that if all else fails, do the very best job you can, and things will probably work out by and large. Uh, this is my mother, and uh, her favorite expression was, uh, one of her favorites, was keep your eye on the sparrow and never give up. She meant that uh, you have to keep focused. Bad things will happen, but with a little fire in the belly and a little determination, you probably turn out all right. That was important to me. Uh, her other expression was, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Here's a picture of me about 1980, and you can't quite see it, but my mother's hand is holding the head of a big catfish, and I'm holding the piece there that's just been gutted. So that was important, too, because you know, it's the balance between work and play that's also important, and the importance of balance is something I think we have to uh, uh, make sure our mentees understand. Well, here's my father, and uh, his expression was hard work levels the playing field, meaning that uh, hard work is a great equalizer. And so, uh, again, as you go forward in the world, son, remember that hard work is the thing that's going to help you succeed. That's my brother, not me. Uh, this is James Frank Tate. Uh, he's the one in the middle. And I was uh, maybe 13 or 14, something like that. And uh, you know, this is kind of farmland where we grew up. And, uh, uh, Grandpa Tate there, you can't see it, had lost his right arm in a factory accident. Uh, he actually was really important in our family. He actually um, uh, set aside something like $300 for each of his three daughters, where the concept was, I'll give this money to you, but you have to go to school. Big money at the time. Uh, but my mother and her two sisters uh, both went on ultimately to finish uh, their um, uh, college education at Arkansas Agricult Ag Agricultural Mechanical and Normal College in Arkansas. Big deal. But he had the foresight to talk about the importance of education early on. And then when I was watching him and we were working around, I would say, Grandpa, how do you do it? Because he could outwork me. I thought I was this fine, strapping, healthy young man. He had one arm and could pick twice what I could pick. So I asked him, and he said, well, son, uh, grandson, there may be snow on the mountain, but there's fire in the furnace. So his concept was about that fire in the belly that guides us, that motivates us. If you have that desire and determination, you will succeed, or at least your chances uh, um, will be better. And the other important element of this is um, there may be circumstances. It talks about the importance of the mentee also being an aggressive part of the partnership, meaning that if your mentor is not a good person, you have the desire, then it's incumbent upon the mentee to try to find someone who's going to help him or her succeed. So it can't be a passive. It's not a passive relationship. It should be an active relationship. And I think that's another important concept. Uh, there's Miss Iola there. Uh, Miss Iola was. Uh, Grandpa Tate's wife. Um, these are her favorites. One, at one point, I figured out how to uh, take a clothespin and launch a lighted match. Uh, 10 or 20 feet, I'd done that and set a small fire. Uh, she helped me put it out, and she said to me that quote, boy, you're smart, but you ain't got no mother sense. So, so balance, again, was something that was important coming on earlier. And then my all-time favorite, uh, talking about the importance of doing good work and not just talking. Thunder's just a noise boy, it's lightning that does the work. <coughs> so these are just some examples that came from my life. Um, I think you all probably have similar stories. But again, thinking back to that uh, paper I referenced, it talks about mentoring, and mentoring does matter. And to me, the concepts are everyone can learn from their experiences, especially from their mistakes. So a person's hindsight as regards their mistakes becomes foresight for someone else. Someone else. Uh, mentors come in all shapes and sizes, but I think this phrase is appropriate. The mentor is a wise and trusted counselor or teacher. Importantly, as you go forward today, we're, we're asking you to help us think about the process, about the mentoring process by which an experienced person provides guidance or support or encouragement to a less experienced person. And then importantly, as I, I tried to reference in my uh, brief, uh, uh, you know, uh, recollection of 
what it was like for me growing up. The relationships are not just formal, they're informal, they may be from family members, they may be uh, from others, but they're all based on consideration, camaraderie, commonality, and confidentiality. So, so, so what's the way forward? Um, what are we asking you to do? I thought I would summarize it here, because I can see that it is embedded in many of the topics that you're going to be addressing today. In my view, as we think about mentoring at UTMB, it falls into these four categories. Space, and that's space writ large. Uh, this is a 360-degree three, uh, assessment of our environment as well as our circumstances. We do mentoring in the context of our current environment and our current challenges. How do we make ourselves successful? And then there's always the issue of people, but we're talking not just about personnel and who does what. I think important that we should be talking about connectivity. How do we connect the efforts that we do across the university more effectively? To get that right, we get to the last two issues, timing. Uh, you know, we are hardworking folks. I think we're extraordinarily bright and capable as much as anyone. So I think we can readily identify the things that need to be done. I think that the more challenging issue is timing in terms of what do we do first in the context of our environment, in the context of our people. And so what's the timing? And then equally important, but I think more difficult, is this issue of tempo. Having decided what's, what's the right thing to do and when we should do it, then the next important question is how fast can we do it? How fast do we need to make those changes? And that, again, will be informed by our current environment and our current circumstances. In any case, uh, those are my comments. Uh, I'm delighted to have an opportunity to kind of provide an overview. I'm delighted you all took time out of your day. I think 100 folks or so are coming over. It says mentoring does matter. And I look forward to your opinions about these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jacobs. I think your presentation to us has many things embedded in it, but what I walked away from listening to your own recollections and your family is that mentoring is both professional as well as personal, and the integration of those is a, a challenge and an important part of as we conceptualize how we can become better mentors. Um, Dr. Bardwash, who is the chair of the Department of Neurology uh, and the Assistant Dean for Faculty Affairs, will be introducing our keynote address, uh, Dr. Traisman. Good morning, everyone. It is uh, indeed my privilege and pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Richard Traisman, this morning. Uh, Dr. Traisman is Vice Chancellor for Research at the University of Colorado, Denver. Uh, and distinguished university professor. He's professor in the Department of Neurology, Emergency Medicine, Neurology, and Pharmacology at the School of Medicine. Dr. Traceman received his uh, bachelor's and master's degree in science from Long Island University in 1963 and 1966, respectively. He received his PhD from Johns Hopkins University in 1971, and then did a postdoctoral fellowship at Bowman Gray School of Medicine. He returned to Johns Hopkins in 1972 and remained there until 2003 as a distinguished university professor. In 2003, he was appointed Associate Vice President for Research Planning and Development and Associate Dean for Research at Oregon Health Science University. He was also Professor of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Medicine. Dr. Traceman has received numerous uh, distinguished awards from both clinical and basic science organization uh, organizations for his work. He received the Lardell Prize for the Society of Critical Care Medicine, the American Society for of Anesthesiologists Excellence in Research Award, the Robert M. Byrne Distinguished Lecturer Award from the Cardiovascular Section of the American Physiological Society, the Stuart C. Culleton Medal and Distinguished Lectureship from the University of California, San Francisco, the Upjohn Distinguished Lecturer Award from Emory University, the Herman Rand Distinguished Lecturer Award from the State University of New York at Buffalo, the Society of Critical Care Medicine Excellence and Research Award. He received an honorary doctorate from his alma mater, Long Island University, and he received the Distinguished Scientist Award from the American Heart Association. Dr. Traceman has participated in study section review committees for the NIH, American Heart Association, and Veterans Administration. 
He was associate uh, editor for the American Journal of Physiology, Heart and Circulatory Section, and was deputy editor for Critical Care Medicine. He was editor-in-chief of the Journal of Cerebral Blood Flow and Metabolism for seven years, from 2003 to 2010, and is past president of the International Society of Cerebral Blood Flow and Metabolism. Dr. Traceman also serves on editorial boards of several other prestigious journals and reviews manuscripts for a multitude of journals. He has served on the many AHA committees and has been a stroke fellow for many years. Dr. Traceman has published more than 450 articles in peer-reviewed journals, has trained more than 200 fellows and students, and has been funded by NIH throughout his career. He was principal investigator of a program project grant from the NIH for more than 24 years and had continuous NIH funding since 1971. Uh, he's presently PI and Director of Pediatric Stroke Center at the University of Colorado and has had R1 support for many years. For more than 35 years, Dr. Traceman has been involved in the regulation of cerebral vasculature and in particular translational research, attempting to translate discoveries from animal, cell, and molecular models to humans with emphasis on normal and pathophysiological states. He has, had, uh, he has made major contributions to our understanding of how the brain and its circulation respond to clinical diseases such as stroke and cardiac arrest, and his work is striking for its breadth and application to the adult, neonate, and fetal brain. Dr. Traitsman. Well, thank you, Anish. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, listening to you. My mother would appreciate it. Uh, everything that you said, uh, she would love. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, thank all of you for coming. Uh, this is a very important issue in terms of uh, mentoring. And uh, what I plan to try to discuss today is largely based on my own experiences with many, many students, PhD students, fellows, clinical fellows, faculty people, uh, many of whom I actually mentored uh, and some of whom I actually advised. And uh, there are differences between mentorship and advising. And we'll get to talk uh, just a little bit uh, about that. So, uh, and, and by the way, I should say, uh, 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 Danny, your comments uh, are such that uh, I probably could sit down now. Uh, you've said all of the most important things. In fact, some of the same uh, words uh, you'll find on some of my slides. So between uh, what you've said and what, with what Anish said, there's probably nothing more I can do to add to anything here, so I probably should sit down. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, um, let's start with uh, a mentor. Uh, a mentor is, uh, the word mentor is often used synonymously with an advisor. So if somebody is a mentor or an advisor, are they the same? Well, the idea really is that they are not the same. Uh, there's a huge difference. Uh, a mentor uh, is uh, personal and professional. It's more than just advising somebody who comes to you for an advice. Being a mentor uh, is much more uh, significant. It requires a huge amount of time and requires much attention to the detail that you and the mentee uh, have to discuss uh, be between you. Uh, the mentor also gives help in many areas advises in many areas, and gives information in many areas. But probably the most important thing is that the mentor needs to give encouragement, always encouragement to the mentee, helps with employment, and oversees every aspect of that mentee's life, whether it be personal or professional, while that person is in your lab. Uh, that's my opinion. That's the way I have done it. Uh, and it has uh, worked out uh, reasonably uh, well. Now, the difference between a mentor and advisor, uh, think about the Godfather movie. Now, I realize that the Godfather movie was made in 1972, 
And as I look around this room, uh, many of you weren't born at that time. Uh, so if you haven't seen this movie, you should go see this movie. Uh, it's one of the best movies that has ever been made. Uh, and mostly from my point of view, uh, growing up uh, in a, uh, uh, a tenement, a poor tenement uh, in uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant in New York, uh, the whole idea of The Godfather has a certain important representation to me. But if you, if you will, what happened to my slide? Um, if you will think about uh, The Godfather, Don Corleone. He was the godfather. He mentored his son, Michael, in every aspect that Michael needed mentoring in so that Michael could become uh, the godfather, as he did. He had a conciliary, a Tom, uh, his name was Tom Hagen. Um, and it turns out that Tom was an advisor to Don Corleone. He wasn't a mentor. He was an advisor. There are differences. And if you look at this movie, you'll see those differences uh, that uh, distinguish between what a mentor is and what an advisor is. So go see that movie. It's a, it's a very interesting movie. Uh, many say that I sound like The Godfather, uh, but uh, my view is that I think The Godfather sounds like me. <laughs> So uh, I'd like to talk uh, first about uh, mentoring of pre-doctoral candidates. And what I'm going to do is to separate uh, mentoring of pre-docs, uh, post-docs, PhD, post-docs, and then we'll talk about clinician scientists and what uh, you have to do with attempting to mentor clinicians in a basic science laboratory. Uh, they're all a little bit different. And you have to understand those differences in order to really be a, a good mentor. So let's take the pre-doc first. This is a student who comes into a basic science department, is looking to get a PhD in four or five years or something like that. Uh, this takes an enormous amount of time for uh, the mentor. It's a huge investment of money. I don't know how things run uh, in the state of Texas, but I will tell you, in Colorado, if you take on a student, that's great, but you pay for them. You pay your tuition, you pay the stipend. Every expense that that student has is the mentor's. Now, where does the mentor get the money to do that? Well, but of course, it comes from your R01, or it comes from your program project, or it comes from any other grant that you have where you can move monies around to cough up the dollars uh, for that the student. Well, there are some problems associated with that, and that is that the student, of course, has to take lots of didactic coursework. I mean, the first couple of years, that's really what they're spending most of their time doing. Occasionally, they can get into the lab. And as the student lives or dies with every exam that he takes, uh, he's got uh, exams in different <coughs> courses. Then he has to take uh, comprehensive uh, written, comprehensive orals. Uh, the student lives or dies by all of those tests. Well, I submit to you that the mentor also lives or dies by those tests as much as the student does. You've invested lots of time in the student, and to have the student flunk out is uh, not a happy experience. Um, uh, and the student, uh, by the way, uh, during the first year or so, maybe they're doing something in the lab, but they may eventually go off and choose another mentor. Maybe it doesn't work out uh, quite as well as you'd like. Maybe the student's interest is somewhere else as uh, he advances in his career. So they're still choosing a research career. And students in general are not necessarily so productive until the end. And then at the end, they leave. So by the time you really get them to the point of being very, very productive, they're on to the next thing, which is a postdoc or faculty position somewhere. So you need to be aware of all of that. 
Uh, maybe that's why some students take seven, eight years to finish a PhD. Uh, I think that's unconscionable, and you as mentors should never allow a student that much time to finish a PhD uh, in a science-based uh, uh, department. And then uh, I think you have to ask the question, uh, looking at all of these positives and negatives, is having a student really worthwhile? Do they really add significantly uh, to uh, your laboratory? Well, I'll just give you uh, the, the names and where these people are. Uh, there's just a few uh, students uh, that I've had that I put up on this list. I've had many more, but just as an example, what have the students that have gotten PhDs from my lab, have, what have they done? I mean, where have they gone? So Bruce Pitt uh, is now professor and chair at uh, University of Pittsburgh in pulmonary uh, in environmental health sciences. Elizabeth Wagner is a professor at Hopkins in pulmonary medicine. Patty Hearn, uh, you all should know Patty. Patty was uh, my PhD student. She was so good, I asked her to become a postdoc. Actually, she asked me, surprisingly enough. Uh, and then uh, probably the best thing I ever did when she finished a postdoc was to hire her as an assistant professor. So she's off uh, doing things uh, now here at the University of Texas. Uh, Tim O'Neill uh, became a professor at Uniform Services in pediatrics and physiology. Corky Steinhardt uh, uh, finished his PhD, went back, got an MD, and is now uh, one of the foremost uh, AIDS cardiologists uh, in uh, Miami. So uh, my, my point is, and, and Judy Donegan was an anesthesiologist first, came back to do a PhD in my lab, and uh, after about 15 years, uh, retired. So my point is that you never really know what people are going to go on to do. So you need to be very flexible in your thinking about how to progress uh, a PhD student. You never know uh, what they will end up doing. Now, what about postdocs? Um, whether they are of the MD variety or PhD variety, postdocs can be extremely productive very, very quickly, uh, which is uh, why uh, probably some of you in this audience who are uh, mentors in basic science departments uh, like postdocs. You like them a lot better than students sometimes because they can really pump out the work publish manuscripts uh, and uh, help your lab uh, immensely uh, by being able to move uh, quickly. And I will uh, uh, also tell you that uh, most of the postdocs are very highly motivated to produce. After all, they're coming to your lab as a postdoc. What are you supposed to do with them? You're supposed to get them as many publications in first-rate peer-reviewed journals that you can. That's your job as the mentor. So if they want that, and if that's what they need to produce, uh, that's what your job is to help them. Also, postdocs can be a bit more independent. Uh, they've uh, gone through lots of training. Uh, they know what to do. They have independent uh, thoughts about things, as do many of uh, the, the uh, uh, pre-doctoral uh, candidates. And the postdocs have really unlimited time for research. And I'll give you an example. What do I mean unlimited time? I had a young person who came from a basic science department, came to my office and said, geez, I really would like to be a postdoc in your lab. And we talked a little bit about what I do and what he wanted to do. He said, well, it sounds perfect. And, and then it was the end. He said to me, but I hear you're pretty hard on postdocs. I said, well, you know, what do you mean? He said, well, I hear you really work them pretty hard. I said, well, let me ask you a few questions. There's a nice young man, and I said, are you married? He said, no. I said, you got a girlfriend? No. You have any pets? You have a dog, a cat? <laughs> I said, no, no, no. Do you have family here in town? And he said, no. I said, well, what else do you have to do except go to the lab and work all day? <laughs> I mean, is there something else you want to do? I, I don't get it. Well, needless to say, he never came back. Uh, so uh, after, I, I guess I really 
did it when I told them uh, my lab is open seven days a week, 24 hours a day. You can work there anytime you want. We'll help you, we'll provide you with anything you need, but you got to work hard. If you don't want to do that, you really shouldn't come to this lab. Well, I never saw him again. <laughs> but postdocs also keep you on your toes. Uh, it, it's been uh, very nice to hear people like Anish uh, come back after many years and say what a great mentor I was. Uh, but what he really doesn't know and what all the other postdocs don't know <laughs> is that, boy, it's a hardship just staying one step ahead of the postdocs. I mean, they're thinking all the time. They have all the time to do what they want, and you're just trying to stay ahead of them with their projects and trying to mentor them and offer them what you can so that they can be uh, successful. Uh, I think uh, postdocs can also, by virtue of their familiarity with a variety of techniques, they can be teachers in the lab. Whether you have students or other postdocs, uh, these people should be mixing, <coughs> learning new techniques, learning how to apply new techniques uh, to their research projects so that they can help uh, the laboratory with new directions. And of course, postdocs uh, have some writing experience. They've written, uh, whether it's a thesis or a, a few papers, whether they be MDs or PhDs, uh, so they can uh, have a number of things to offer a laboratory. But what do you do with a postdoc? How do you, how do you mentor a postdoc? Well, the first thing I think that I've tried to do is to start them on a project that you know will be successful and publishable. Don't give them some technical problem that might take four years to do and maybe they won't do it. Maybe they won't be successful at doing, doing it. Then you add a second project once their first project is on the way. And make sure they collaborate not only with other postdocs in the lab and students in the lab, but make, make sure they even collaborate outside of your laboratory with other laboratories within the institution. Maybe even have a co-mentor for this postdoc. So if uh, it's a neuroscience uh, person, maybe you need somebody in cell or molecular biology uh, to also provide that aspect of uh, the training for this uh, student. Uh, the postdocs also uh, can uh, ex expand the, the, the techniques. As I said before, they can bring new ideas, energy, they can help the lab. And you also want to get them on the road towards getting a grant. You got to get a grant. I mean, I know it's hard these days, but that's what you have to do. I, I'm sure all of uh, the people who've come through my lab uh, will remember my famous staying, saying, and that is that uh, there's a very thin line between being a goat and being a hero. It's an NIH grant if you haven't figured it out. And I, I think you can be the worst kind of person, but if you've got NIH grants, you're like a genius. You're fabulous. I mean, everybody loves you. But if you don't have anything, you might as well say goodbye because nobody's going to help you. So I, I think you need to teach people, mentor people, how to go about getting grants. It, it is an art, and you need to figure out how to do it at an early age because if you're going to be successful in this world, you're going to have to do that uh, for the next 50 years. So um, uh, as uh, I'm trying to do. Um, uh, so that's important. Money uh, talks. Uh, and I was saying uh, to uh, uh, Danny earlier today, um, I used to be able to say that green is good no matter where you get it as long as it's legally obtained. <laughs> I have to question the legal business now because in the state of Colorado, as you know, uh, uh, pot uh, is legal. Uh, we're bringing in uh, millions of dollars of taxes uh, based on, on pot, which is uh, certainly legal in Colorado, but boy, you can't take it across the border. You, I mean, it's an illegal substance in uh, almost all of the, the other states. So maybe I will have to adjust that. In some cases, we'll take uh, illegal money, uh, depending upon where you uh, get it from. Um, and uh, the next thing for postdocs is to publish all those manuscripts. 
Remember, the job of the postdoc is to go make data. You go make the data, and you make sure that those data get published in peer-reviewed journals. I don't care about case reports. I don't care that uh, Dr. X asked you to write a chapter for some book. That's nice, but doesn't cut it. Uh, besides which, who wants to hear about a chapter from Dr. A when he's never published a paper before? What has he got to say that's important that somebody else wants to, uh, to read about? I, I think you need to consider how much time it takes to do chapters and books and so on and so forth before you really make a reputation. Then when you make a reputation like me and they ask you to write chapters, you say, oh, I'm sorry, really not interested. I, I don't want to waste my time doing that. So, so you need to prioritize what your goals should be. And the way I think about it, the goal should be to publish in peer-reviewed journals. That's the key. Uh, I, I think um, uh, for postdocs, again, we come back to the idea that the mentor is involved. This is a long-term commitment to somebody's career, to guide somebody over all the hurdles that they have uh, over, over a number of years. And it doesn't necessarily stop once they leave your lab. At some point, the idea is to try to have them be independent investigators, so you can't continue to mentor that way, but they can always come back to you, hopefully as a friend, and you can give them advice as an advisor, not any longer as a mentor. And the other thing I think you need to try to do, and uh, I've tried to do this, uh, sometimes successfully, uh, is to make nice. You gotta make nice and create a productive uh, environment that's fun for everybody in the lab. If it's not fun for people, they're not going to be productive. So if they're having problems at home uh, with their wives, their husbands, their kids, you need to interject yourself uh, sometimes into those issues to try to get better productivity out of people so that they don't walk around with all of these uh, doom and gloom uh, strategies and end up not being uh, successful. Making the environment fun, I have found, will always lead to uh, success. Now, just to show you, uh, again, I want to use these people who have come from my lab and show you what they have done after they have been postdocs. Ray Kohler was one of my very early postdocs as a professor at Hopkins in anesthesia. He's been there for 35 years. Uh, Dave Wilson uh, worked in my lab as a young faculty member, postdoc, then faculty member. He's now a program officer at NHLBI. I plan to make use of his skills uh, with my next program project uh, next year, which will be going to uh, NHLBI. Uh, hopefully joint funded between NHLBI and NINDS. Uh, so Dave uh, owes me something and it's time to collect. <laughs> just, just like the Godfather, you never know when I'm going to come up and ask for something, but when I do, I expect you to be there. Uh, uh, Patty Hearn, as I said, uh, I don't need uh, to make any comments about Patty other than to say uh, she's She's been terrific. Uh, she and her husband uh, stayed in Baltimore with me. We moved to uh, uh, Oregon together. Uh, then she came to University of Texas. And uh, as far as she tells me, she's doing a great job. <laughs> so uh, Avi Gertner uh, ended up uh, being a president and CEO of a biotech firm that's actually quite successful. Uh, so uh, he came from the lab and uh, decided to move into uh, industry. Cindy Willard Mack was a veterinarian who decided to come to my lab and is now a professor of veterinary medicine uh, at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Don Burke, uh, professor at uh, Pennsylvania and now at Drexel uh, as a biomedical engineer. So again, my point is you never know where people will go and with appropriate mentorship that mentorship can really move across fields uh, into many many different areas and give people opportunities now 
What about clinician scientists uh, and uh, young or old clinical faculty people? I think the key to mentoring clinical scientists and clinical faculty is non-clinical time. If you don't have non-clinical time, you will not be successful. Uh, now, I understand all the ramifications of non-clinical time in terms of dollars and uh, how, how much it costs to, to do this. Uh, I can tell you that uh, with uh, non-clinical time, uh, I once had a, a chair at Hopkins and we had about maybe 12K awards in the Department of Anesthesiology, all at the same time. Anesthesiologists make a lot of money, but, but a K award only provides $75,000. Who's paying the rest of their salary? Where does it come from? K award says you can spend 80% time doing research. Well, how does the department do that? And I remember we ended up with a, a couple of more K awards, and the chairman of the department came running into me one day. He says, God damn it, Dick, you're going to break the department. You keep bringing in these people who have K awards and fair awards and awards that are very nice awards, but they're not bringing in enough money to pay their salary. I said, well, look, I mean, what's it worth to you? You want to be academic or you don't want to be academic? You want to have the department's name at meetings? Uh, you want to publish papers? How much dollars is that worth? I mean, I don't have an answer for that, but if you want to be academic, these are the kinds of things that you have to do. And the hope is that these people can trans transition from a K award to an R01 award or some sort of a program project that can actually return that money. But also remember what they've done previously in terms of the reputation of your department and your institution. So for the clinician scientists and even young faculty, they may be young assistant professors who really don't know quite what to do, <clears throat> but you get them involved, you start slowly. You give them an easy project, very easy project. You give them early success. Get them to publish an abstract. Get them to present an abstract at some fancy meeting where their peers are and colleagues are. Once you get them hooked, then you just reel them in. So it just takes a little effort to try to give them a taste of success for the rest of their career. And they'll mostly come along and do well uh, with you. Then I think you need, uh, with uh, the clinician scientists and young faculty, again, I come back to uh, grants. Uh, you got to find ways to get these people funded, whether it be K Awards, American Heart, uh, NIH. I mean, even if somebody comes as uh, um, a faculty person, I mean, there are all sorts of awards available, and uh, you need to go uh, try to get these awards. You'd be surprised. Uh, as I have been for years. How many people come to my office as young faculty people? And one of the things I do every week is send out requests for applications from all sorts of uh, funding agencies. So every, re every week I might have 10, 15 uh, new requests that are out there. And people come running to my office and say, gee, do you really think I should apply for this award? I said, no, you shouldn't apply for it if you don't want the money. If you want the money, you better apply for it. I mean, nobody ever gave me a grant that I didn't apply for. So why are you asking that kind of question? It's like a rhetorical question. I mean, it doesn't make much sense. If you think you have something that uh, can uh, that can move forward, this uh, machine is uh, working by itself, which is interesting. Okay, and then you need to train these people to be independent and to be collaborative. Collaborative is very important for the clinical people uh, and even for the basic science people these days. Uh, you don't find basic scientists anymore who go into the lab, close the door, work by themselves and come out six months later and say, oh, I got two great papers and I have another idea doesn't work like that. There are too many things you have to know. There are too many techniques that you have to use that you might not be trained in. 
So you need to collaborate with people who know how to do all of these things. So uh, just to show you, these are all clinical people. And I'm going to point these people out again uh, because I'm trying to make a point here. Um, these are all MD people or young faculty people. Uh, we can start at the top left, uh, Jeff Kirsch. I won't go through all of them, but I'll just pick out a few. Jeff Kirsch is chairman of anesthesiology at OHSU. Charlie Schlein is chairman of pediatrics at Long Island Jewish uh, in New York. Becky Eichord uh, is an adult neurologist who suddenly became interested in children's and is now director of the, uh, at the University of Penn, CHOP uh, uh, Children's uh, Stroke Center. Uh, if you look at people like Dan Hanley, who came out of my lab, I mean, Dan is the father of neurointensive care. There was no such thing as neurointensive care before Dan got there, but he moved into, uh, into that uh, area. If you look at John Ulitowski, who uh, is the outgoing chair at Hopkins in anesthesia, Lee Fleischer, chair of anesthesia at Penn, Dave Nichols. Uh, is uh, president and CEO of the American Board of Pediatrics, of all things. Uh, Jeff Balzer, uh, the dean and CEO at uh, Vanderbilt. I had a great deal to do with mentoring uh, Jeff uh, at, at that time. Peter Pronovost, uh, probably the most significant person in terms of patient care and quality outcomes uh, in the world. And he went into that area. Um, and, of course, I don't need to say much about Anish. Uh, he's done uh, great. Uh, Yuichi Maruki is uh, now president and CEO of Saitama University Hospital and Medical School, a completely uh, different uh, uh, area. Uh, Bob McPherson, who was one who I never thought would succeed at doing research, ended up having a couple of R01s over the course of his career and tragically uh, passed away uh, some years ago. Myron Yaster, um, a professor of pain uh, anesthesia, uh, who actually holds the Dick Traceman chair uh, at Hopkins, uh, has done extremely well. Mike Breslau has gone into a company called VisiQ and ICU from uh, remote uh, places. So my point is, you never know what these people are going to get into. Yet you, as the mentor, have to train them in a way so they can do anything. I mean, that's, that's the whole point of this. We don't need to create clones of ourselves. I mean, so I do a lot of work with stroke and cardiac arrest. I don't need to train everybody to go do work in cardiac arrest and stroke. That, that's not the purpose of being a mentor. We need to provide opportunities encouragement for our mentees so they can go off and do the kinds of things that they want to do. And what are the things we need to be careful about promoting in these uh, young people? We need to promote creativity, their own creativity, not mine, theirs. We need to promote the ideas of reason and how they analyze data, how they write papers. I mean, the whole analysis of, of how you do things in science will help them in terms of treating patients and will help them in terms of doing their research, whether their research be basic science research or clinical re research, clinical trials or otherwise. They need to be independent. You have to mentor them to develop collaborative networks uh, so that these people can be adaptable to a changing time. Science changes. Uh, what's interesting is that in my entire career of now, I guess, 45 years, I'm not doing much different than what I did before. Uh, but now I have a new, a new name. I'm a translational scientist. Before, I used to be a physiologist, and that went away. Then I was a pharmacologist, and that went away. Then I was a bench-to-bedside person. And, I mean, there are all these names. But, you know, what I do is not different than what I started to do 45 years ago. I want to take basic sciences, whether they be animal models, genetics, 
molecular uh, aspects, cellular environments, and try to translate what I find in those models to the patient. It's all the same. I've been doing it for years. I just have a different name now. And that's okay. You call me whatever you want, uh, but I'm not going to change what I really feel needs to be done in terms of uh, science. You also have to promote professional ethics uh, in the laboratory. People are writing papers, they're working with data, uh, they need to understand what that means and, and that data is really king. Papers are king. You don't fool around with these things. There are ethical principles that uh, everybody has to follow. And the big issue is to train scholars. That's what we want to do. We want to train scholars, scholarly people who can move with the times and move into many different areas and be successful in, in all of those areas. I guess one of the key issues for that is don't marry your hypothesis. There are too many people who have hypotheses and at all costs they'll keep that hypothesis. Well, a very smart man once told me, don't marry your hypothesis unless you really want to get divorced soon. <laughs> what, what I have found is hypotheses are, they're a dime a dozen. The key is how to explain those hypotheses based on real data. And if you can get people to understand that concept, uh, they will do a lot better in terms of their own careers uh, as uh, they move forward. Uh, I've had uh, just about uh, 200 students, fellows, PhDs, MDs, young faculty people uh, in my lab. Uh, at least one of them is here in this room. Uh, I've worked with uh, Anish Bardwaj for many years, uh, many productive years. Uh, mostly happy years, I would say. <laughs> uh, but I, I think uh, it's, uh, it's hard to train people. It's hard to mentor people. Their future is in your hands as a mentor, and therefore it's stressful. Because when you start to think about it, I mean, it's your job to get these people moving ahead. You need to worry about uh, getting them to be successful, getting them uh, opportunities for <coughs> positions, and so on and so forth. If you don't have the time or desire to mentor, don't waste your time doing it. It'll be bad for you, and it'll be bad for the mentee. And there will be no success uh, along those lines. Uh, so I guess uh, towards the end here, uh, uh, is it worth it to be a mentor? Considering all the things I've said, everybody has to make their own decision about that. But there are obvious advantages to your laboratory in terms of being a mentor and having people uh, in your laboratory. And I would ask the question, who among you would say that it was not worth to have your children? Well, maybe <laughs> some, but <laughs> mostly not, I, I suspect. And the mentees that we have are basically our scientific children. And just like we hope for the best for our real children, uh, uh, these scientific children are the future for science and medicine. And if we don't mentor them properly, uh, there might not be as much science uh, in the future. I'm worried about science in general. I'm worried about clinician scientists and the lack thereof. Uh, they're going away uh, slowly, maybe even faster than uh, before. I worry about NIH funding. It's not easy to get. I worry about funding from other agencies, which is not easy to get either. Um, nevertheless, uh, I, I think uh, each of you have, has to answer the question for yourself as to whether it's uh, worth uh, being a mentor. And finally, it's not all about the mentor. You got to be a good mentee. Now, I don't know how many mentees are in, are in this room. I think most are faculty people. But some of the characteristics for an appropriate mentee is that that mentee needs really to screen the mentor. Just like the young man who came to my office and said, geez, I understand you work people very hard. I mean, that's a screening process. And all mentees should at least have a good conversation 
<clears throat> with the mentor to determine, try to determine what's expected. And good mentees have to listen. They don't have to be subjugate, but they have to listen and evaluate what they're being told. They need to ask questions. They need to be inquisitive. I mean, in, in uh, my lab, we've always had completely open discussions, uh, arguments about science uh, that has been really terrific. I think uh, the mentee needs to try to build a relationship with uh, the mentor. Uh, they need to work hard to learn. They need to set goals for themselves, discuss those goals, and then up update the mentee. The mentee needs to update the mentor uh, in terms of what those goals are and what the direction is. They need to take uh, initiative, keep an open mind, be confident, be honest with your mentor, but respectful, which sometimes is not easy to do, um, and be able to accept criticism. Now I can give you one example of one of my PhD students who, Bruce Pitt, was the first graduate student I ever had in my career. And Bruce wrote a thesis he wrote 500 pages worth of thesis material. He gave it to me when it was finished, and it came back with 500 pages of criticisms. You know, it was all marked up in red ink and black ink, and it was just, it was crazy. And I know this is true because he has pictures of it. <laughs> and I would write in the margin, I mean, what the hell is this? This doesn't mean anything. This is crazy. What are you talking about? I would say it in otherwise not so nice language, uh, which he also has pictures of. Um, and so he went back, he accepted the criticism, went back and did this again. Sure enough, we went through the same routine. This went on three or four times. And finally, Bruce says that he took the original thesis that he gave to me and he brought that in. And he says that I said to him, now this is just what I'm looking for. <laughs> so so the, the idea is many times ideas have to cogitate, they have to congeal, they have to, they sort of have to become what you really expected them to become. And it takes time to do that. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, the criticisms uh, were accepted. Um, and the, men, the mentee also needs to show some appreciation uh, to the mentor who's spending all of this time trying to help him. Now, the answer to the question, as uh, was brought out before, mentorship does matter. It matters because it shapes the careers in ways that you don't even know how those careers are going to be shaped in the future. But it's very important to, to do that. Now, in terms of the mentee's uh, relationship with the mentor, uh, I learned uh, a lot on a trip to Alaska with a close colleague and friend, uh, George Dover. George Dover is the chairman of pediatrics at Hopkins. And uh, we and our wives and a few other people were up uh, in Alaska kayaking and all sorts of things. And uh, you can see that uh, this kayak uh, with these two rather large human beings sitting in this kayak was pretty close to waterline. <laughs> and it turned out that every time we would row, water would come splashing over the top of the kayak and into uh, the boat where we were sitting. So we sort of figured out that we were going to have to do something <laughs> different. We had to do this in a fashion that we wouldn't get chased by bears. Our guides told us, don't go near the side of the river because bears chase these orange colored boats. <laughs> well, naturally being told not to do it, we did it. And sort of, and it was very interesting. I mean, to see these bears up close was fabulous. But when they started to come after the boat, it wasn't so pleasant. And we had to figure out very quickly how we were going to row together, 
how to row in a straight line. Can't be going all around the place being chased by bears. We had to move quickly. And we had to be optimistic. All of those characteristics are involved in mentor-mentee relationships. And the final thing we had to remember is not to sink. And I will tell you, it was, uh, with this kayak being so low in the water, if we had turned over, there was no way that you were going to extract us from this kayak. There's no way. So, I mean, even when we did get to the end of the river and, uh, you know, the guides, I mean, it took four of them to get each one of us out of this kayak <laughs> because we were all wet and, you know, everything, I mean, it was just, uh, it was a mess. So remember those things when you're involved in mentoring. They're all important. And mostly they're important for the mentee, but I would submit that they're just as important uh, for the uh, mentor. Of all of these people that I've had in my lab, I mean, they've all been terrific. They've been helpful to me personally, to my lab. I've grown enormously. Um, and I would say I've been lucky to have uh, really a fabulous group of people in the lab over the years. So I've, I'll be happy to answer any questions. And uh, if you have, and I'll be around for the day for the other uh, sessions as well. So thanks very much. We're privileged to have uh, a one of our own uh, give us the next uh, presentation, uh, Becoming a Better Mentor. Uh, Mark Holden is uh, the uh, Edna S. and William C. Levin Professor of in Internal Medicine. Uh, <coughs> He's Division Director of General Internal Medicine and Vice Chair for Undergraduate and Continuing Education of the Department. I've heard him give a similar talk of this many uh, months ago and I was very impressed. So I'm very pleased to uh, ask Mark to come up and talk to us today. Thank you very much. Uh, those of you who saw that presentation many months ago will be happy to know that all of the references that I've used are new except for one, so um, that, that part is, is brand new. As we've heard, mentoring is a very complex um, task, a very complex job to do, and there's a lot of information in the literature that will help us towards becoming a, a better mentor. That's what I'd like to do with you this morning, if this thing will work correctly. So somebody who's much smarter than I and much more creative, uh, Dr. Super published a paper now many years ago about the importance of mentoring. In this case, he was talking about surgery, surgical faculty, surgical researchers, and using mentors as a, as a, a, a great um, term here. He identified a number of important roles of what mentors do. We've heard about many of these so far this morning, and I'll just let you take a look at the list as a reminder. So mentors have a very important job. They have a lot of things that effective mentors need to accomplish. So really the question is, how can we become better mentors? How can we do these things uh, better? How can we have better outcomes? for ourselves and for our, our mentees. So I know we have a very mixed audience this morning. So what I've intentionally done is I've drawn from the literature from multiple areas, from uh, those of you who do medical student teaching, uh, those of you who do um, teaching and nursing in the, in the natural sciences and other areas. I've actually pulled literature from different areas so that I can give you a little bit of perspective of, of what different areas and different disciplines have to say about mentoring, but what you're going to see very quickly is that what they say, a lot of it is pretty much the same. It's very overlapping. Um, and the references that I will list, which I'll be glad to provide anybody who'd like to have them later, is the reviews that I'm summarizing are, are excellent reviews. They talk a lot about the background of, in mentoring, the science of mentoring, and provide resources for you, no matter what discipline you may be approaching mentoring. It's not working. So those of you who teach medical students, can I get a, who, who's involved in teaching medical students? I know many of you in the room teach medical students in one way or another. So if you look at this um, review of the literature, it was a, a, a systematic review of the literature from 2000 to 2008 that looked at what was published in the literature regarding mentoring for medical students at, at uh, medical schools. And they identified a number of 
things that are important for effective mentors, the common themes across those across the, the literature. And effective mentors empower and encourage the mentee. We've heard that a lot this morning, that empowerment and encouragement are, are really critical to being a successful mentor. They serve as a role model. There's a whole science of role modeling as well, which we won't go into, but beyond being the teacher, uh, beyond being an advisor, they also serve as a role model. They help the student build a professional network. We'll talk more about that. And they assist in the mentee's per personal development as well as their professional development. They identified from the literature the two major requirements, if you had to pick two major things for mentoring uh, with medical students, is to establish a confidential relationship and that the mentor has an extraordinarily strong <coughs> commitment to that mentee's development and, and success. Those were the two hallmarks across the literature related to mentoring programs for medical students. But as has already been pointed out, don't forget the mentee. There can be no successful mentoring relationship without a mentee who is prepared and ready to engage in a mentoring relationship. So the things that were identified as most critical for the mentee to do in this relationship is to set the agenda, to follow through with commitments, to accept the criticism which we've heard illustrated, and the mentee needs to be able to assess their performance and the benefits they are deriving from the mentoring relationship. So the highly successful mentee has these traits and characteristics. And an additional, um, this is not a, a systematic review, this was a uh, study done at, at two different academic health centers, one in Canada, one in the U.S., and looking at academic faculty and mentoring for academic faculty. The population that they said it happened to be departments of internal medicine at these two schools, but I, I think this is, holds true across other departments as well. That if you're going to mentor academic faculty in the health science center, the mentor needs to be altruistic, honest, and trustworthy, part of the essence of that relationship. They need to be active listeners. Um, I've been on, on both sides of that, where I have been a good listener and I've been a bad listener, and I've talked to people who were good and bad listeners, and I know how it feels. The most successful mentors have significant professional and mentorship experience. So the cream of the crop have done this before, They've been through it, they've learned, and they've, and they've experienced uh, uh, improvements from that. But we all have to start somewhere as a mentor, so we're not going to start out with that type of experience, but we will get there. The effective mentor will provide career guidance, offer emotional support, which is sometimes really difficult. Sometimes we're really good at working in the professional arena, but touching on that other person on the mentee's professional life and professional challenges maybe isn't always so comfortable for some of us. The mentor needs to look at and be prepared to discuss work-life balance, um, especially with some of the generational changes that we see. The importance of work-life balance is only becoming, going to become greater in the future. The mentor helps create opportunities for, the, for their mentees, and they warn and protect. They help in a way to keep the mentee out of harm's way. They help them negotiate. They help them stay out of um, uh, landmines and, and sand traps. They help them avoid the pitfalls of their institutional milieu. That review also looked at what were characteristics that they looked at relationships that had been successful and those that had failed. What could they, how could they distinguish? What were the characteristics of the successful compared to the failed mentoring relationships? The successful relationships had reciprocity. That is, they were two-way streets. They were bi-directional. So it wasn't the mentor dictating down their hill to the mentee. It was a bi-directional communication and feedback and working relationship. Both the mentor and the mentee showed and demonstrated mutual respect for each other. It's not a one-way street. There were clear expectations. This is where I have probably fallen down early on as a mentor. I didn't set clear expectations for me or the mentee, and it took us a while to get back on track. The mentor establishes a really uh, genuine uh, personal relationship with the mentee, and they have shared values. Um, in fact, if they don't have enough overlap, enough connection, enough chemistry, it, it's going to be an impediment to an effective relationship. So failed relationships, mentoring and otherwise, poor communication, a lack of commitment, the mentor's inexperience. Um, mentors need to gain training and coaching and their own mentorship. It's going to take a while for them to develop a, a, a track record of experience. If there are significant personal personality differences, it may not be a good combination.
In my own uh, experience as a mentor, um, I had a mentee who on paper looked like a great fit between the two of us. We just didn't gel. No matter how hard I tried, we were just too different. It didn't work. If there are conflicts of interest, either perceived or real, same with competition. If there's a sense or the reality that there is competition between the mentee and the mentor, it's also not going to be successful. And then a somewhat older review, and this is the only reference I have that's actually repeated because I think it's really very, very good, from the Journal of General Internal Medicine, uh, 2009. Uh, the authors um, looked at, again, this was a systematic review of the literature, and looking at mentoring in academic medicine across uh, multiple uh, uh, institutions. <laughs> that effective, in addition to the things that we've already talked about, and I don't want to repeat things that have already come up in the, in the previous literature, but <laughs> things that they add to, to the literature, is that effective mentor understand the mentee's needs. They can get in the head, they understand where the mentee is, where they need to go, and what their needs are. And that they're non judgmental. It can be difficult for sometimes when there are generational differences. Sometimes the mentor has the best intent. They may understand. They may come across in a, or the mentee may, may perceive that as being a judgmental approach. And they're accessible. This is one of the biggest challenges, especially in today's economic climate, for the mentor to have time that they can be available to their mentee. This is particularly challenging. In my experience, if you don't schedule it and put it on the calendar proactively, it's not going to happen. Again, coming back to uh, the importance of the mentee being a partner in this relationship, the mentee has to be proactive. In many cases, the mentee is the one who initiates the relationship. It doesn't have, to, doesn't have to work that way. But they need to actually, one of the authors says, they need to drive that relationship. That may be a little strong, but the mentee is the one who needs to step forward. They need to uh, ask. They need to identify. They need to solicit the help of the mentor. And they need to be selective. They need to have discernment in terms of accepting advice from the, from the mentor. Uh, sometimes the advice, advice may be well intended. It may not be quite right. Or, in our current climate, many mentees have multiple mentors. They may find themselves caught between mentors with conflicting advice or conflicting interests. So the mentee will have to discern between those and to negotiate differences. So I'm going to leave the academic medicine field for just a moment, and I'm going to look at some literature from other health professions. This happens to come from, from, pharmaceutical, from pharmacy education. Again, that's repeated uh, of many of the things that I've already identified. This particular author identifies four domains or areas of, of mentoring, personal, relational, professional, and mentor self-care. And these are some things that they have added to the list that I've already provided to you. That the mentor is aware of professional boundaries, and this is sometimes where things go awry in mentoring relationships. And they're also aware of potential cultural, gender, and I would add generational differences. Generational differences are becoming uh, much more of, a, of an impact, I think, uh, in terms of establishing relationships with junior faculty or students or, or trainees. The, the, the differences um, can sometimes be an issue. The effective mentor continuously monitors the mentoring relationship and the mentoring process. It's that having that third person view as you're, as you're working with an individual, also having the third person view of how is this dynamic going? How well are you facilitating? Doing an assessment of your own skills and an assessment of, of that process of mentorship. Do you mean, need to make an adjustment? Do you need to make a change? Looking at your own progress in the third person. And the thing we often forget is that just because you're a mentor doesn't mean that you do not yourself need mentorship. So um, it's sometimes people perceive that when they've reached that level or whatever that level is that they no longer need mentoring. I, I think that's, that's a, a misunderstanding. Turning to the nursing literature, this was a very interesting um, a study where they actually looked across academic disciplines, not specifically health disciplines. It included a significant number of nursing <laughs> faculty, which is why it's reported in the nursing literature, but the, the uh, studies that was done included um, people from other natural sciences, from sciences, engineering, and technology. 
So this is a very broad-based perspective, um, but a, over a third of the of the population in, in, the, in the analysis were from nursing education. They identified eight key components of effective mentoring relationships. And as you can see, I'm not going to read these eight disciplines to you. This is a nice summary of the things that I've already mentioned from medical student education, academic faculty education, and natural science education. This is a nice synopsis of what those components look like in terms of, of effective mentoring. So I'm going to turn from that literature background and change past just a little bit. Um, when I developed the, uh, led the development of the student learning communities for the School of Medicine in about 2006, one of my major Herculean tasks was to figure out how to help develop mentors for those, for those programs and there was a, a need for a large number of mentors. So I looked at a lot of resources at that time, and one of the ones that I found that I continue to use and I find extremely helpful is a book um, by Lois Zachary called The Mentor's Guide. I'm going to give you a quick synopsis of that and an application of this book um, during the rest of the presentation this morning. So she talks about four phases of mentoring, preparing, negotiating, enabling, and closing, but the idea that this is a continuous loop. You're always preparing for the next phase, and as you're closing out one mentoring relationship, you're likely preparing for the next. This has significant overlap with four phases that were developed by one of the, the original um, people who did work in mentoring, uh, Dr. Kim. Before we talk about those four phases, one of the things that she begins with is a, an overview and an emphasis on strategies for effective uh, facilitation. Now, those of you who do uh, small group learning and other facilitation, this, is, this will look like a very common list to you. This is not unique in any way to mentoring, but these are some of the important critical skills when you're in the room one-on-one -on -one or in group mentoring so that you can facilitate these conversations in establishing these relationships. Not rocket science. But unfortunately, these are the pieces that sometimes fail us. Being able to ask respectful but challenging questions. Reformulating statements. It helps me develop clarity. It helps the other person develop clarity. It promotes reflection. Summarizing what you've heard can help make sure that you both have the same understanding. Listening for silence. Listening reflectively. Listening actively. Critical in these relationships. Helping you as a pair and the mentee as an individual develop goals and accountability. Who's going to do what on what timeline and holding each other accountable. Scheduling the meeting times is absolutely critical and it's the step that I have to make sure I do. When my mentee walks out of the room, we know we're going to meet in a certain time frame and if I do my job, I'm sending a meeting request before the person gets back to their office. Uh, and making a commitment. When, we, when I sit down with a mentee, we have to make an agreement and a commitment to what we're going to, to try to accomplish. And many programs recommend that that be done in writing as a contract. So now I want to lead you through, in a summary fashion, those four phases and give you a little bit of a summary of that information. And I've selected some uh, short uh, clips from the movie Tuesdays with Maury, which many of you uh, may, may know or may remember. Um, uh, regarding a uh, coach who's dying from ALS and one of his former students comes back to connect with him and we see glimpses of the previous mentoring relationship and we see that mentoring relationship renewed and it illustrates some of the principles that I presented either from the background literature, from the techniques for effective facilitation and then of the four phases and that will, will conclude the presentation. So in, in the preparation phase, both the mentor and the mentee have to prepare. They're getting ready for this. If it's a mentor who's not mentored before, they need mentorship training. They need to, need to review what it is they need to accomplish. Who are they going to be working with? Mentoring um, is not the same from a pre-doc to a post-doc to a, a level one medical student to a pre-medical student to an associate professor. They are not the same, and you're going to talk about more of that later. Defining the roles of these uh, individuals in the relationship, preparing the relationship, that initial engagement of the mentee is really important. Uh, as was said, you need to get them on the line and then reel them in. So you, you need to begin this process. And making that connection is critical or they don't come back. So let's take a look at how some of this um, comes to be in this initial encounter. Are you happy in Detroit? Yeah. 
Best town to be in for a sports writer. Football, basketball, baseball, hockey, you name it. Are you giving to your community? I think that's for sports, you know? That's what I give them every day in my column. Are you at peace with yourself? <laughs> I can't complain. Uh huh. What happened to the music? Wasn't that your passion to be a great pianist? Yeah. Yeah, I gave it a shot. And I grew up. You grew up, huh? Married with kids? Uh, no. Haven't found anybody to share your heart with, huh? No, yes, I have. Definitely. Oh. Now we have to get married. Uh, no. Well, yeah, yes, I mean, you know, someday, but uh, just when we're both ready. When you're both ready, uh, has she got a name? Janine. Janine? It's a very beautiful name. So Janine shares this when we're both ready thing with you? No. <laughs> I can see, Mitch, that we're going to have a great deal to talk about. What are you right. writing? So I think the coach is entering the, the mentoring relationship. The mentee suddenly realizes he's caught back in a mentoring relationship. Great examples of active reflective listening, reflecting back to, the, to, the, to, to Mitch, and probing questions that are non-judgmental, but quite meaningful. The next phase is the negotiating phase. This may be long or short. Um, but in the, in the negotiating phase, both the mentor and the mentee have to negotiate what are their goals going to be. How are they going to measure their success? Essentially, it's program evaluation on a small scale. And establishing the sense of mutual responsibility. And what are the ground rules? Ground rules might include, um, if you need me, call my secretary. If you need me, send me an email. If you need me, here's my cell phone. Send me a text. How comfortable are you with how you want your mentee to contact you? And how available are you? If you're in the operating room all day long, how is the mentee going to reach you effectively? This has to be planned in advance. The negotiating is not something that just starts and stops in a, in a phase. These phases overlap and they often repeat themselves. So the negotiation is at the beginning, and there's a lot of negotiating to be done, but as you'll see in subsequent uh, clips, negotiation continues to occur throughout the, the relationship. Let's take a look at this next phase where there's some negotiation. Days like this used to hold classes outside. Uh, today is Tuesday. Tuesdays I used to hold office hours. Oh, write tutorials and you'd rip apart my papers. <laughs> and we'd talk. And we'd talk. You were the first grown-up who ever talked to me who wasn't a relative. And we're still talking. I mean, maybe you think what I'm talking about doesn't apply to you now. You know who I forgot to ask you about? Your girlfriend with the beautiful name, uh, uh, Janine. Janine. Yeah, now, am I ever going to meet her? Oh, I don't know, Coach. Um, no, Coach. Uh, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. You still don't know how to say goodbye, do you? Still. Come here, I'll show you. <laughs> oh, Mitch. I'm going to get to you one of these days, boy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs> did you forget something? When can I come back? Office hours are Tuesdays. We're Tuesday people, Mitch. So we have a little bit of negotiation here, not a lot, there'll be more to come later, but we've set some ground rules, we know when we're going to meet. Um, we don't yet know what our, our, what our outcomes are going to look like, but we clearly have the establishment of a relationship, we have a connection, uh, we have a personal touch that's already been established. And the, pro Here we go. the enabling phase is probably the most productive and probably the, the funnest part of the mentoring uh, cycle. That's when there's tremendous growth of the mentoring relationship, <coughs> tremendous growth in the mentee. That's when we see a lot of personal and, and other situations professional growth. This is when it feels really good to be in a mentoring relationship, assuming that it's going well. You see the mentee move along. You see your, your relationship moving along. Uh, you have connected on multiple levels 
and you're if you haven't already you're getting to that friends you're maybe getting to that friendship stage with with the mentee so i'd like to in this next clip look at where mitch is now compared to where he was in those first two encounters what is that well if you're going to keep giving me this meaning of life stuff i want to remember it i'd like your voice when i'm dead no don't say that <laughs> mitch i'm dying that's been established yeah, yeah. Well, it's a pretty big machine, huh? Must have cost you a fortune. You know what? This is a stupid intrusion. I'm sorry. I'm going to put it away. Hey, you still don't understand. I want you to remember. And I want people to know my story. That's a very nice machine. Put it back. Come on. Okay. Okay. So I made a list of subjects for you to talk about. All the heavy stuff. Death, love, marriage, family. Oh, all of the stuff that you're scared of. <laughs> Things I want to hear you talk about. And you're scared of. Why be ashamed? Everybody's afraid of those things. Add fear to the list. You don't seem to be scared. I told you, I have my early morning moments. <coughs> Did you ever know anybody who was dying? Yeah, I had an uncle, Mike. He was young, he was more of a brother, really. Testing, testing. <clears throat> Mike taught me football, taught me music, taught me how to drive. <laughs> we used to drive around this empty lot for hours. Yeah, he was 42 when he died. <clears throat> Cancer. And you never talked about it? We did what people do, you know. We pretended nothing was wrong. Mm. That's actually when I gave up music, when Mike died. Oh yeah, when you grew up. Huh? I woke up, coach, so I better get moving if I'm going to make anything out of my life. Well, you made a big success. I always knew you would, but you ran. Did you ever stop to think about what you're running from? <clears throat> okay, what do you want to tackle first here? Death, love? What about marriage? It's a good one. So we see ongoing negotiation at the beginning of the clip. They're still negotiating. Uh, Mitch is a different person than where he was in the beginning. He's now driving the relationship. He's coming in with a list of questions. He has the topics that he wants to talk about. He is very engaged in this relationship, and he is he's taking the ball, and he's now coming into the mentor with, these are the things I want help with. Can you talk to me about these things? It's no longer the mentor who's now directing down to the mentee. <coughs> It, excuse me, in the final closing uh, phase of the mentoring relationship, um, the emphasis is that we shouldn't suddenly get there and then find ourselves that the mentorship period is ending if we anticipated that it was going to end. The idea is that all mentoring relationships will eventually end, transform, reconfigure, that, that something's going to transition at, at the somewhere in that, in that mentoring relationship. Either the person's going to move along in their career, uh, they're going to move away geographically. Um, the mentoring period may be predefined if it's going to be from here to here, and we are going to end that relationship at the end of that time period. So the idea that the, the relationship may have legs and may continue to, to go on for years and years and decades, but preparing yourself as the mentor and preparing the mentee because if they have developed a very good, effective relationship with you, when that time comes, whether it's even if it's a good thing, they're, they've got their doctorate degree or they've gotten the chair of a department someplace else, there's going to be a transition, and that transition may be bittersweet because they are going to lose part of what they have um, developed with you as a mentor. So prepare for that eventual transition or, or loss of the relationship. At the time that that occurs, it's very important to both for you as the mentor and for the mentoring relationship to reflect back on where you came from in that relationship and what you accomplished. If it's grants or publications or degrees or um, um, you've gotten a chairmanship somewhere, celebrate those accomplishments. It's going to be important for your mentee because remember this is all about the mentee, but it's also important for you as the mentor because this takes your time, it takes your energy. Part of what you gain from the mentor relationship is your own personal growth, your own satisfaction, um, the, the idea that you've helped somebody else along. Celebrate that. It's, it's part of the energy that you need to continue mentoring uh, the next person. 
So this is a closing scene. And think about the, not just the death of this individual, but think about the death of this mentoring relationship. I picked the spot to be buried. It's on a hill under a tree. It's got a pond. Great place to think. You plan on doing a lot of thinking there? I plan on being dead there. <laughs> Will you come and visit and tell me your problems? Won't be quite the same, not hearing you talk. Well, I'll tell you what. When I'm dead, you talk. I'll listen. <laughs> what if, uh, you know, after your... Uh, What if all this was just what what if all this was just wasted on me? Well, you think that could happen? Well, out in the world, you know, outside this room, things aren't so clear. <laughs> your wisdom and your aphorisms. Once you learn how to die, you learn how to live. What if you can't learn that? What if you just want to run like hell when you see death coming? What if uh or like your father, you know, what if we we can't learn it because we're not really like you. Yeah, but you are like me. Everybody is. Nobody's like you. And if it took you your death to teach me these things, then I'd rather not learn them. All the things you said, I'd give them back in one minute. If this wasn't happening to you. It's happening. It's, it's, it's going to happen. Yeah, well, I don't want it to happen. I don't want you to die. That poem you're always quoting now. We have to love one another or die. We die anyway, don't we? We learn to love somebody and they die or, or we die or it dies. What's the point? What, what did we learn really from all that suffering? Hold. I'm sorry. I just can't accept that I don't want you to die. I guess I formed the course, huh? Death ends a life, not a relationship. Poor bitch. You still don't know how to say goodbye, do you? Look at me. Don't you understand? You touched me. What if you had to go back? This is the way we say goodbye. When I'm dead, you talk. I'll listen. It wasn't that hard to hear his voice. It was Tuesday. Have you ever had a special teacher? One who taught you things you may not understand, but who never gives up? Who knows the really tough lessons take a lifetime to learn? The last class of my old professor's life took place once a week on Tuesdays. The subject was the meaning of life. The teaching goes on. I'm going to close with this quote from the same uh, paper that I began with. This is, the, again, this is the article on the importance of research for surgeons and surgical researchers. I'm just going to let you read that quote and reflect back on the scenes and the discussion we've just had. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Questions, comments? Yes. Dr. Holden, you said that the um, uh, generational uh, differences 
you, you comment on the generational differences, and I think you said that they're more impactful or more important now than, than they used to be, or something. I, I don't understand what, what you meant. And maybe it's my awareness of it that's more, that's greater than what it used to be. Um, and, and maybe it's my own perspective on that. I'd be curious about those of you in the audience who um, may be a little more senior than I am to see if that holds true from previous generations. Each time there's a generational change, there's always been differences and conflicts and potential issues. Um, um, it may just be my longer, longer experience that allows me to now see multiple generations coming behind me, each with their own flavors and characteristics, and I often have to uh, do a dance of trying to figure out which generation and which priorities I'm working with. Other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh